You are listening to Rechurched, a podcast aimed at instigating Christians to be Christian. Hey, what is going on, everybody? My name is Ethan Hoover, and I am the host of Rechurch Podcast, and I'm joined by my co-host, Matthew Mayer. What's up, dude? Yo, yo. Ready to rock. Ready to rock. Awesome. So we left off at a really big point in time where Islam was starting to rise. Uh, We see the first major church split happen, which was called the Great Schism. And after that, we see the fall of the Roman Empire which leads us right into a period called the Dark Ages. Um, And now in the last episode, I know we said we're going to skip through the Dark Ages and land at the Protestant Reformation. Right. And while that is mostly true, (laughs) it is not fully true because we actually do want to spend a little time going through the Dark Ages to a degree um, and looking at what the true church was doing during this period called the Dark Ages um, because... A lot of this stuff that was happening through the true church actually gave way to what is known as the Protestant Reformation in 1517. Um, So, Dark Ages. The goal would be not to take a deep dive into this time period. There's a lot of details. We would know it as the Middle Ages, a.k.a. the Mm. Dark Ages. And Ethan, you covered how the Roman Empire split. Right. Yeah. And that covers a large period of time. In fact, it's like a thousand years. So some would say 476 was when Rome fell, but the Roman Empire seemingly continued until the 1400s. And I've often looked at it historically and said it didn't really fall as much as it faded. And I believe that's the case because Daniel's prophecy linked with the book of Revelation and the prophecy of the end time scenario speaks to a revived form of the Roman Empire. So it's Mm. interesting to see it, how it didn't fall, it faded, and it's going to resurface. Mm. But I digress. The Dark Ages, as it's called, that because there was great illiteracy during that time period, Mm. a lot of it was religious or even political. And here's what happens. After this monster of an empire seemingly falls, the Roman Empire power is no longer centralized. Right. So picture large areas of this previous empire now exposed. And this is what gave rise to the feudal system. Mm. Now here's why that's important. Germanian barbarians, as they were known, were invading those areas. And little city towns or villages were completely exposed. So Mm. nobility, some people that claimed lineage to um, monarchies, they began to buy up the land. Hmm. And then the feudal system existed where you have a certain lord, let's just call him a landlord, because that's where we get the term. (laughs) The landlord, yeah. yeah. And he is basically lording his land over these people known Uh as peasants. Hmm. They're working his land, he's benefiting off of them, but he's protecting them. So think about that. He's protecting them With his army. Yeah. It's kind of like what you see in the movie of Braveheart. Did you see Braveheart? Oh, yeah. Oh, such a good movie. Right. Similar idea about these walled cities and they had like their own little structure Mm. and certain nobilities protected the people and there was loyalty there. Anyway, why is that important? Good question. (laughs) It's because during this time, people began to isolate. Mm. So you see religious sects beginning to isolate themselves, which created, and you said the term- earlier it created what uh monasticism monasticism what is that word uh i think it's like it has to do with monasteries that's it right the monastery monks. system and monks and what we know of the monastery system monasticism or monks is that they isolated themselves mm-hmm. right and they claimed deep meditation in isolation mm. now there's pros and cons to this time period one called the Dark Ages because of the biblical illiteracy, ultimately. This is a spiritual issue. And that was because of what the Roman Catholic Church did? Because, like... Remember, the Roman Catholic Church was controlling what the people knew about God. Right. And they weren't allowing the commoner or the peasants, the lower class, 
to have access to the scriptures. Remember, it was often in Latin. Right, which was like a dead a, a dead language. Not sort of. many people spoke Latin. Yeah. It was the Latin for the the educated, more or less. And if you don't have access to God's word, you can easily be manipulated mm. and controlled. Yeah. So the dark ages is this time where the light of God seemingly is dim. Mm. But we know that's not the case because the true church is always moving forward slowly and subtly. But during this time period of monasticism, you get pros and cons. Pros you get these guys who were preserving the scriptures at the time, mm. right? Right. And writing tenaciously. Is that a word? Yeah, tenaciously. And writing tenaciously about theology. And like some of that, the writings from those time periods are are amazing. Because they were like, they were spending all this time me- literally meditating right. on the word. So they it, they were coming up with like profound realizations of scripture that like you the normal person going you know doing their well in modern context going to their job and right. reading the word like probably won't stumble upon because they're not deep dive and studying into god's word so that's a pro right preservation of truth which is what we're going to see is a common theme throughout the church history those that rise up to preserve truth the con the negative was the church and the Christian, the believers, were not meant to isolate. Right. We were we were meant to interact and engage community with the light of the gospel. So you see a dimming of sorts of the light of God, as we call it the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages. You see this feudal system coming into play. You see monasteries on the rise, monk life, isolation, while at the same time, people begin to fight back or Mm. push back against the Holy Roman Catholic Church. And that's what they called themselves. Yeah, and although Rome fell, the Catholic Church was still alive and well. Alive and well. To a degree. (laughs) Not not, not, not with the intention of the meaning. (laughs) Right, right. So we're talking about isolation. We're talking about, you know, you hinted at groups of people starting to rise up in isolated ways against the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and so that that's important to know mm-hmm. that we, we think of the Protestant Reformation as like the start of reformed theology. But that's not the case. Right. There were people throughout the Dark Ages that were actively reformed themselves but also trying to bring reformation, reformation right. to Christianity, if you will. And so some of those groups of people were the the Lollards, the Waldensians, the Petrobrusians, all these types of and groups of people rose up against the Catholic Church doctrine before Luther ever picked up a hammer. I mean, th- these were happening like 1100s, 1200s, 1300s. Like Martin Luther wasn't on the scene till 15. Correct. So that, yeah. <laughs> so remember the Roman Catholic Church and it, the reason we're covering it is because of the amount of influence and prominence and power and wealth that this church traditionally, notice I said traditionally, yeah. not biblically, yeah. accrued. And there became this hierarchical system, as we've already covered in past episodes, where the people were being used and abused like pawns Mm. in a Ponzi scheme. Yeah. And then you get these individuals who are touched by the Holy Spirit, and then the true invisible church begins to confront this false religious system. Yeah. And what you would find when you look at all those groups you just named, names such as John Wycliffe or John Knox or John Calvin or John Huss, and I chose all the Johns because yeah. these guys had such <laughs> pivotal roles that led into Martin Luther's actual hammer. And I, get, I loved mm. how you framed that. Mm. Before you hear the echo of that hammer, the 95 Theses, there were people who were confronting the Roman Catholic Church. 
And all of the issues mm. literally stemmed from their doctrines that included indulgences, purgatory, veneration of Mary, mm. praying to saints, and manipulating and controlling their people. Wow. And true believers were like, wait a second, this is wrong. This is not true. <laughs> this is not true. This is not what the early church and the letters that were circulating tell us is proper theology. So it, you're right. Before we get into, I think it was 1511 would be the exact date of Martin Luther nailing his 95 theses, which by the way, you 15, can probably- 1517, but close. It's 1517? Yeah, I think so. 1517. I have it pulled up. That's no, good. This is, this is why we, we use each other. Read those 95 theses. They're not long. They're literally like one or two sentences at a time. That's funny. And they can all be filtered down to Martin Luther, Luther's issue with the indulgence system. Wow. Like, this is wrong. People <laughs> think they're saved when they're not. And then you can get your religious arm in their mm. pockets so that they can give you money. That way you're buying a soul out of purgatory. Like, you, you, he, over and over, that's what he's saying. Boom. Boom, this is wrong. This is control. This is wrong. And he's quoting scripture along the way, just talking about no faith in Christ alone. And this is where we, you know, we 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 get the the five solas. Yeah, the five we'll, solas. We'll yeah. get into that later on. But um a couple people I want to talk about, yeah. not in detail, but when I did my research, John Wycliffe was on the scene in England in the thirteen hundreds. Mm. All right. So think about this. John Huss is in the Czech Republic in the 1400s. Wow. Then you have John Knox, who's in Scotland in the 1500s. Martin Luther, Germany, 1500s. John Calvin, France, 1500s. Yeah. And Ulrich Zwingli in Switzerland in the 1500s. And there's uh, also uh, Girolamo Savonarola, who's like an Ita- who is Italian. Right, Italian in Italy. Friar. Yeah, Italy. And they're all chipping away at this monstrosity of a structure of Mm. false religion. And what you discover is in their own right, in their own time, in their own area, each of them had a passion and a clarity to present the word of God, the written word of God in the language of their own people. Mm. Why would they do that? Because the Roman Catholic church was doing, did the exact opposite of, of that for like a thousand years. Right of holding it with this dead language no one knows what the scripture is actually saying right they're like people need to know that's right they need to know truth like that's that's bottom line so the church's teaching and tradition was in their minds equal to the holy scriptures so if you're in that holy roman catholic church you're assuming that what you're being told Hmm. and the traditions that you're engaging in are just as authoritative (laughs) As the Holy Scriptures. That's crazy. So you don't know any better. Wow. Which is interesting, and I digress again. Today, right? The 21st century, the reason why people are so manipulated, spiritually speaking, and even politically speaking, is biblical illiteracy. Yep. So think about the reason these guys were passionate. The Lord was like saying, no, you need to put my word in the people's hands. Yeah. Because if they engage me on their own, this is God. If they get to know my heart and my will and my way and my law on their own, they can no longer be controlled. Yeah, man. Think about that. That's really good. Well, so with biblical literacy or illiteracy, I think that needs to almost be defined. Like, what do we mean by biblical biblical literacy? Because I think people can go, oh, I'm I'm literate. Like, I'm I can read the Bible, but like, there's a difference between reading it at just face value or reading it contextually. Because I would say the Catholic Church. They were biblically illiterate leading the church as well, because although they could read scripture and quote scripture, it was not used in context. And I think literacy has to do with not just being able to read it, but be able to understand what the application is based on context. Right. And I think that's what we're trying to say is like the people nowadays and back then too, they needed to not only know truth, what the Bible said, but what it said like right. in in context of these different situations and things that the Roman Catholic Church kind of twisted certain ways. Yeah, so I think false teachers, false leaders, they can quote scripture and if you're a, an average congregant and you're sitting in that church or watching online 
and you might know some of the Bible, but they might say something that is taken out of context. So biblical literacy would be going, wait a second, that sounds disjointed yeah, or disconnected, that much. <laughs> right? And having those spiritual ears to go, wait mm-hmm. a second, that's off. That's what I mean by biblical literacy. Got it. And that's what I meant by biblical illiteracy during that time was people to have access to even read it in yeah. their own language. Not that oh. they couldn't read. Yeah. Um, right, right. And the problem is true today where people in the churches, they're sitting there and they don't actually know the word of God. Mm. Mm. And each of us are responsible to be diligent as the Bible commands us actually be diligent to present yourself approved to God a worker who does not need to be put to shame, right? Mm. Rightly handling the word of truth is how some people translate that. Rightly handling the word of truth. How do I handle the word of God so that I never find myself in a situation where I'm put to shame or Mm. I'm embarrassed, Mm. right? Imagine being brought in as a a cook, right? Your resume said you can (laughs) cook and now you're in the kitchen. The, you know, the proverbial saying is true. (laughs) If you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen, but the heat is on. (laughs) And in that moment, you realize you can't really cook. <laughs> oh my God, crap. Right? So are you not going to be embarrassed? Oh, I'm definitely going to be embarrassed. Right, so so that's what that verse means. A worker who is not put to shame. Mm. A worker who's not going to be um, embarrassed because mm. you really don't know mm. what you said you knew. Mm. That's good. <laughs> so yeah. the goal would be to look at these guys' lives and go, wait a second. Another fascinating correlation is that God was moving people in different areas Mm. to accomplish his way and his will through their individual lives. Yeah, that's good. So when you think out there that you're just one person, what impact can you possibly make on the world, on a community? Look at these men in history and their willingness to stand for truth in the midst of a culture of lies is what God used to literally spur on what we call the Protestant Reformation. Yeah, and you see that application in present context with our episode that we released, what, two episodes ago for the special episode on Hot Mike, the pulpit and politics. Like, we're, we're focused on how do we change, you know, allow change to happen. We ourselves get involved it takes just one person like to start focusing on the community wherever they're at so it's like taking that application and putting it in present context that's that's what we mean it's like god's planned to do somewhere for a reason you know be a light in that community fight for truth one of the connections made ethan was with john knox so you might have heard his name before he was responsible for spurring on what was known as the scotland reformation or even the Scotland Revolution, mm. he had an he had a theology that connected religion, the sacred, with the secular, right? And that was often the social political. He believed, similar to what I believe, that the Christian's light should shine in every industry, mm. and God has given us His divine design in His institutions, and we should protect them and preserve them. Mm. John Knox's name is quoted by our founding fathers really as one of the inspirations behind what we call the American Revolution. That's wild. Right? Breaking off of tyrannical rule. Wow. And one of the individuals who used John Knox's writings and his life was Patrick Henry. Wow. That's crazy. So it's just interesting to see how A parallel. This was all happening in Europe, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And in their given context, God's raising people up, some names more known than others, but we make our way into the 16th century. And the person that really, pun intended, nailed the Roman Catholic Church down was Martin Luther. So before we go any further, I kind of want to go, not back, but just kind of sit here for a second and just help our listeners realize the, the consequences that these guys, uh, that we mentioned, like, um, John Knox, uh, Jean Hus, um, and several others 
the consequences they faced by stepping up and out for truth against the Roman Catholic Church. It wasn't just like, hey, be silent, stop talking. It was it was real. Right. A lot of these guys got burned uh, at the stake, hung, or both. A guy got burned and hung. So th- there's a lot of consequences that happen. And I don't think you see really the same fate happen to like the Martin Luther's and on um, as much as you see it in the, in this dark ages period, but they actually all, but before we, yeah, I love what you just did there. Take us backwards because you did make some points earlier about names and movements that I would say most of us, myself included are unaware of. Yeah. Right. I don't know who half these people were. <laughs> right. Until I, like, and and the, the goal isn't for our listeners to go, I now know who these people are. Right. I think the spirit of these people is important to catch, hmm. which would include, remember, it wasn't just a church. Hmm. It was also a church with state powers. Hmm. Okay. So when I use the words state church, I'm speaking to the structure that had authority to do these, these two things. These guys that were putting their lives on the line for the true gospel, the word of truth, were either excommunicated by the state Mm. or executed. And nobody talks about that. No one does. If they do, it's look at church history and how bloody it was. And I'm going, (laughs) again, here's the goal of this season. Church history is not always church biblically. Yeah. And it was the quote church that's right quote, quote church execu- executing and killing and being bloody that's right. against the true church and and you would be astonished and i'm saying this to you ethan i'm saying it to our listeners how many people were actually killed mm. by the catholic church can't imagine during this time period mm. so there's something to, to be said about the consequences of standing for truth and how yeah. many people probably didn't and yeah. I'm saying today, the consequences of standing for truth and the cost that you might have to pay with your job or with your reputation or with maybe your time. I know some people in our land who had to do jail time for mm. standing up for what they believe in. And I'm going, we're seeing a shadow of what could eventually be real persecution. Yeah. Yeah. And the threats that exist for holding to, ready? Biblical truth. Yeah. Which is what these guys, when they use the word reformation, reforming, they're saying, whoa, our theology, our doctrines, our movements, we are way off. We need to reform this. Yeah. Right? And we're kind of there again. <laughs> we're kind of there Here. again because <laughs> it's it's people would like to believe, you know, there's this silent majority out there and I'm going, I don't know, man. Yeah, I don't know. I don't see it that way anymore. Mm -mm. I don't see it that way because I think there might be more people who no longer see the Bible as true than there are those who take the Bible as true. Yeah, that's good. And the question would be, as they did it back then, are we willing to put our lives on the line now? And Mm. when we say that in the American context, it's almost like I I roll my eyes in the back of my head. Oh, okay. But- Gosh, the American context is completely different from what's happening around the world right now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's why we take it for granted. Yeah. And it's easy to lose something that you don't actually protect, preserve, and appreciate. Yeah. So as Christians today, I think regardless of consequences that come, are we willing to stand for truth against whatever structure it is? Right, whether it's the traditional church model in America, whether it's what they call Big Eva, right? Big yeah. Eva's evangelicalism, whether it's the government, state, truth is truth. Truth is truth. And as believers, we are to be those that stand for it and never cease to speak it. Hmm. So I think the goal of this episode, before we go into anything else, Ethan, would be to ask ourselves does my thinking need reform? Right. Yeah. And I think also just another parallel to just take away for our listeners to take away is these guys that weren't really noticed until like you have to research it and find out about them 
and the people that they served beside that have no recognition, they were putting in the hard work day in, day out, put it, and for truth's sake, for the Lord's sake. And in their lifetime, they probably didn't see much progress, if any progress. Wow. But the progress came. God used that as a stepping stone to later down the road for the Protestant Reformation. And so like, I feel like I get caught up in like, God, I'm, why hasn't this changed? Like I'm doing it. And he's like, who are you? Like serve me, like stand for what's right, for what's true, what the, for what my word says, leave the rest up to me. Like, you're not, you're not David, like to go back to it, but like, you're not, who are you? You know, like just do, just be faithful, be faithful. And that's what these people did. They did. They were faithful. They were executed and they were like, they probably were almost like not gave up, but just like, man, I don't see the fruit of it, but now we see the fruit of it. I don't think any of them, Martin Luther included, Mm. ever saw the fruit of it. Think about that. You just kind of opened my eyes to a vein that should be tapped into. They were just putting their hands to the plow day by day, serving the Lord, whether it was in obscurity, whether it was in private, public. There was no media. Yeah. There was no interviews. They were just doing what is right. Right. So think about that. We read about it historically and go, oh my goodness, the impact. We're feeling it. We're impressed with the writings and and the work and the messages and the sermons. And and they were just doing it day by day, just as we're doing it day by day. Yeah. Right. So think about that. For anyone out there, just keep doing the next righteous thing. Yeah. Know the word so well, again, that when something comes across your proverbial plate, you can recognize it and go, wait, that's wrong. Mm. And then do the work to renew and reform your own heart, your own mind with the Holy Spirit. And you will look back one day and say, wow, the Lord used me by his grace alone. Or the eternal rewards that will be waiting for you in heaven. Yeah. And the crowns that you can drop at the feet of your king, yeah. Jesus. The point would be, while I'm here, I'm going to do the work of the Lord and leave the consequences to him. Yep. I'm not measuring it against man's scale. I'm not measuring it against whatever measurement system I came up with to, you know, make me feel ultra spiritual. I'm doing what is right and leaving the measurement up to whatever the Lord deems as good. That's great. You know, as a good reward. That's such an encouragement for all of us. It, 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 and I guess we can end like this. Um, it's easy to look out on the horizon hmm. in our world and be discouraged or be disoriented or be deflated and wonder, am I making a difference? And the goal would be to see Christ who during these time periods was stirring in the hearts of common individuals. Hmm. Yeah. For real. And recognize our God never leaves himself without a witness And if each of us take our responsibility seriously as Christians, we will do what Jesus said we will do. We will be the light of the world, right? So these dark ages that we currently live in, you be the light. Yeah. And in these days of decay, you be the salt, (laughs) right? Preservation. And here we would create a spiritual movement Mm. based on the remnant. And it's not about numbers at this point. Right. And it's not about, here's what people think, external revival or another great awakening. And I'm going, I don't know, guys. I see it differently. I see it maybe a couple years ago. I would agree. We're going to see an explosion of people coming to the Lord. I don't see it that way. I see it as a revival isn't necessarily about external growth as much as it's going to be about internal purification. Yeah. Hmm. Why? Because Christ is preparing his bride. Yep. And I believe that's the days we're in. Cue getting ready. That song, getting ready. We're getting ready. (laughs) You can actually play that on the podcast so our people get amped up. Yeah. Hopefully we don't get copyrighted. (laughs) Anyway, that is uh, a good amount to take in. And as you can tell, we didn't actually get to the Protestant Reformation yet. And that's okay. (laughs) That's okay. We were planning on this. So um, I hope all of that makes sense to you all listening. Uh, it's going to make more sense once we dive into the Protestant Reformation next episode. So hang in there. We'll see you next episode and God bless.